What goes into your daily cup of coffee? And what is that worth? Far more goes into producing your cup of coffee than you can imagine. You probably didn't know this, but some of the world's best coffee is grown in one of the world's smallest countries, the Republic of Panama, whose highlands are now often referred to as the Bordeaux of coffee. But since the early 1900s, Panama has been known mostly for its canal, also recognized as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. This is a story. It's the little known and surprising story of how a generation of Panamanian farmers rose to the summit of world coffee against all odds. It's a story about how the value of one of the most popular beverages on earth transcends what's in your daily cup. Many of the coffee farmers in our story descend from the pioneering immigrants that came to Panama around the turn of the century to help build the canal. After working on the canal, some of them moved to the Panamanian highlands to take up agriculture and coffee. Decades later, in the early 1990s, when their grandchildren were inheriting the farms, coffee prices suddenly plummeted, and everyone nearly lost their livelihoods and their way of life. It was a very close call. What happened in 1989, uh, the price of coffee came down, way down. Immediately after the United States decided not to continue with the agreement with the ICO. And prices went down from $1.30, I think it was at that time, to 59 cents per pound. So when that agreement was broken by the US, the price of coffee came down. And, and immediately, we had a coffee crisis. In 1989, the International Coffee Agreement, a quota system established between coffee consuming and coffee growing countries, collapsed. The ICA, as it was called, had been created in the early 1960s during the post-World War II era of paranoia over the spread of communism. Its purpose was to stabilize volatile coffee prices and in turn, the economies and governments of developing countries around the world susceptible to communist infiltration. The U.S.'s withdrawal from the ICA in 1989 coincided with the end of the Cold War, and it wreaked havoc on coffee farmers in Latin America and around the world. Yeah, the International Coffee Agreement, who started in the 60s, went into the 70s, and into the, the late 80s, certainly. And every country and every producing country and consuming country had quota. The notion was that if the price of coffee fell below 140, quota would be restricted, so the price came up. If it came up to $1.60 a pound, then quota was given out so that the price would come back again. But the price was held for 20 years in that 140 to 160 region. Los precios con cuota eran superior, mucho, mucho superior a los precios normales que no eran de cuota. So the system worked very well for the producers and not badly for the consumers. However, in principle, this bothered mainly American coffee buyers. They felt that this was if I may use the word, socialist. And once the United States stepped out of the agreement, then the agreement collapsed because they were the biggest consumer. Coffee has always been a volatile business, but the breakdown of the International Coffee Agreement was catastrophic for coffee growers everywhere. Once it was gone, coffee prices crashed, losing around a third of their previous value. At the same time, volatility spiked, creating huge price swings. Mi papá lo empujamos a que dejara su finca hortícola y se metiera en café, que era un cultivo más estable, porque se estaba poniendo viejo, ¿verdad? Entonces, eso fue eh, un paradigma que en realidad 
lo encajonamos en un solo cultivo y cuando empezó a cosechar, el precio del café se cayó. The money that we were selling it for, that's the money that we were paying our workers. And sometimes even not even that. Sometimes the more we produce, the more, the more we were losing money. My memories as a kid were my father, my grandfather, and my uncle arguing because they had to sell a farm. There was a sensation of failure. We were losing the business. Not only one farm, the whole business. No, coffee was, wasn't going to make it. Why were coffee prices on the free market even lower and more erratic after the collapse of the International Coffee Agreement? A quick look at the modern history of coffee reveals the dark story behind it. To begin with, it's helpful to see who's producing coffee and who's drinking it. Coffee was discovered in Ethiopia around 800 AD. In the 1100s, it made its way to Yemen, the Arab world, and finally to Europe in the 16th century. From there, the Dutch began to cultivate coffee in their colonies, mostly in Java. France followed suit and in the early 1700s brought a coffee plant to the island of Martinique, where it thrived and spread throughout the Caribbean and Central and South America, completing the globalization of coffee cultivation. Coffee planting and harvesting has mostly been done inside a swath of land spanning more than 50 countries, all located between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. This area is known as the Coffee Belt. Coffee Belt countries are in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Many of them are relatively poor, and many were former colonies. Traditionally, most of the coffee drinkers have been in Europe and North America, and especially in the United States over the past 200 years. Beginning with the Boston Tea Party of 1773, the colonies chose coffee over tea as a form of rebellion in a display of independence. And Americans have been drinking increasing amounts of it ever since. By the early 1900s, the U.S. accounted for over half of the world's coffee consumption. But if the guzzling U.S. in the North didn't have the conditions to grow coffee, where did they get it from? The short answer? Brazil. During the early 1700s, Brazil began growing coffee on large plantations, powered by slaves and later low-wage European immigrants, making coffee among the country's largest commodities. By the beginning of the 20th century, Brazil was providing three-fourths of all the coffee consumed by the United States and much of the coffee for the rest of the world. Brazil's coffee production was erratic, though and periodic overplanting and harvesting flooded the international market, driving prices as low as 10 cents a pound for long periods of time, even decades. In other years, bad weather and plant disease would suddenly destroy tons of coffee crops, adding to the misery and hardship of farmers and laborers who were already making very little. Volatility was made worse by price speculation and political upheaval. Together with other newcomers on the coffee growing scene, like Guatemala and Colombia. After the turn of the century, the two world wars and the Great Depression of the 1930s did little to quell the demand for coffee in the United States. They just intensified the need for cheaper coffee. To satisfy the growing demand for cheap coffee and still earn as much as possible, the larger corporations selling coffee needed to scale and capture market share. So they kept buying up smaller competitors, all the while standardizing this inferior coffee, cleverly advertising it, and constantly making it ever more convenient. U.S. coffee quality and taste declined to the point that few people actually drank it black, creating a complementary market for flavor-enhancing additives to hide its bitter taste. Just two drops are the same as one teaspoon of sugar, but without the calories. Sweet is as sweet-tasting as sugar, the best-tasting of all leading artificial sweeteners. And you don't need six or eight or ten drops. 
there's enough sweetening power in one little bottle of sweeter to sweeten 380 cups of coffee. About 100 more than the sweeteners in the big bottles. Sweeter, also in tablet or granule form. By the mid-1900s, coffee was a very big business, and roasting and distribution in the United States was concentrated in the hands of just a few large companies that controlled the market. Today, commodity coffee prices, or C market prices as they are called, remain around or below a dollar per pound. And less than 10 cents of every dollar spent on coffee actually goes to the farmer who grows and processes the raw green beans sold for roasting. This means that since the 1980s, prices have fallen in real terms by two-thirds while coffee farmers' earnings have been cut in half. This combination of forces has led the global market for one of the most popular beverages on Earth to rely on an old world, exploitative production model that makes it easy for the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. Back to Panama in the early 1990s. A handful of younger generation growers returning home from studying abroad at the beginning of the coffee crisis, chose to stay in coffee, despite the odds. This decision reflects the very nature of Panama's Chiriqui Highlands, the country's agricultural frontier that surrounds an extinct volcano. Populated and developed by an eclectic mix of nationals and immigrants, this part of the country is known for its tenacious pioneering spirit, which is as much a part of Panama's history as the canal itself. The prices were very depressed, so it was not a profitable business. So I thought, well, I need to do something else, uh, you know, uh, around uh, agriculture. So I started planting other crops. So we went into sweet onions, Vidalia onions. We started shipping onions to the U.S. And it was going okay, but it had a problem. The problem was that every time that that was in the hands of my products because they were perishable. One day I was looking at my products and I thought, well, why did my grandfather go into coffee? And the reason was because he could process the beans, hold on to them, and then find a market. At that moment, we had our family coffee farm. So I said, I'm gonna go back to what my grandfather did. He was more smarter than I was. So I started to try to see what we could do with coffee. How can we do to elevate the quality and the uh, price that we get for our products so that we can all live better? Coffee had become in the US and in Europe a warm colored water. No one really tasted it. It was something to drink socially. It was very weak, it was terrible stuff. But about this time, in the 80s particularly, the concept of specialty coffee began catching on. This was mainly due to a group of roasters on the west coast of the United States who said there's got to be a better way to produce coffee. And these craft roasters began promoting this idea of specialty coffee, a coffee that tasted good. The most famous of these pioneering roasters was Alfred Peet, the visionary Dutch-American who opened Peet's Coffee, Tea, and Spices in Berkeley, California in 1966, during a time when the United States was going through a period of social unrest and cultural transformation. Pete's mission was to sell high quality, flavorful coffee, and the anti-establishment culture of the times lined up outside his shop to buy his revolutionary brew. A few years later, Alfred Pete taught his craft to three young men who had been inspired by his efforts, Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Boker, and Zem Siegel. They had wanted to do something similar in Seattle, so in 1971, they opened a place called Starbucks. Around this time, someone even came up with a name for this new trend. In 1974, Erna Knudsen, another European immigrant dedicated to the coffee cause, coined the term specialty coffee. From that point on, Specialty coffee described varieties from distinct geographic microclimates that produced unique and superior flavor profiles. Erna went on to become the unofficial spokesperson for this new industry and was eventually recognized around the world as the godmother of specialty coffee. So 
So we were here with a whole business. We were already a bigger business. We were exporting quite a bit of coffee. And then the question was, what are we going to do? So I told my dad, you know, I'm going to go to the States. I'm going to check over there. And I'm going to check the market and see what do we have to do. So I went to California. And I made all this appointment. And I, the first person that I met was Erna. And I explained to her, you know, this is what is happening. And somebody told me that you are dealing with the best coffees of the world, that you are the one who brings the best coffees of the world. Can, we, can you talk to me about it? And she was the one who shared with me what it meant specialty coffee. They had this idea that there was great coffees around the world because they could cup them. They could taste them. They could do all this evaluation of what really makes a difference in coffee. That uh, first uh, uh, incorporation of the Specialty Coffee Association of America was in 1982. And its objective at, its, at the outset was to create a good business environment for specialty coffee. And so it was very focused on um, providing small roasters and small retailers um, with the tools they needed to succeed in the U.S. marketplace. At the time, they were competing with the, the big commercial brands that were uh, sold in grocery stores. Um, and that were at a much lower price basis, but with huge marketing budgets. They took specialty coffee toward direct trade with farmers, bypassing traditional brokers. They led trips to countries of origin to better understand production, promote coffee quality, and advance grower participation and profit potential. They were looking for something that had a different flavor profile so that they could compete with the mainstream. I felt myself, this is the way we either make it or we don't make it. At the same time, specialty, unlike commodity, was making coffee cool. Coffee shops everywhere began to take on an all new look and vibe. Coffee beverages were given foreign sounding names and tasted much better. The decor got hipper and the servers became baristas. And coffee brewing was transformed into a fine art. Baristas and brewers are now like artists. They can distinguish between different kinds of coffee, mix flavors, explain the roasting process, and create innovative and tasty coffee-based beverages. Today, many coffee baristas and brewers are now celebrities. They compete in national and international competitions, the largest of which is the annual World Coffee Championship. They amass tons of followers and significantly influence consumer taste. Price Peterson, which was a very you know, knowledgeable guy with a lot of experience, a solid businessman, he came and he advised us and he said, let's try to do whatever other countries are doing to catch that consuming market. Panama formed the Specialty Coffee Association of, of Panama, currently known as SCAP. This involved Wilfred Lamastus, who at that time was president of the association, signing a memo of understanding with the Specialty Coffee Association of the United States. And I remember the ceremony, it was up on a big stage, there were lots of people looking on, because this was a first time that the Specialty Coffee Association of America had made any movement outside the United States. There were many things that happened, okay, after we started, you know, moving very dynamically into the specialty coffee world. And all of us were very eager. We, we said, well, this is, I mean, this is our opportunity. Las cosas cambiaron bastante porque se hizo un nuevo grupo que peleaba por calidad. So it started to create a new market where we could send coffees to, and a market that was willing to pay a little bit more for the extra work that we're doing regarding processing or farming. Panama's coffee growers were getting organized. They were getting international support, they had excellent coffee and excellent growing conditions, but they had a problem. One of the things we realized in the early 90s was that no one knew that Panama produced coffee. It was one of the best kept secrets of the world. People were asking us, so you guys grow coffee in Panama? We thought it was just a canal. 
So they decided to take their show on the road. They even made some brochures. The specialty coffee movement then began prospering and moving on, and they began having conventions. We had a booth of Panama coffee, and the big logo at the top was, Wanna Know a Secret? Panama produces coffee. The idea was to do two things. One was to learn more about coffee, and the other one was to try to get Panama on the map. We had about five young guys who spoke English pretty well at this convention of five, 6,000 people. And one of the things they had was educational sessions where the speaker would stand up and talk for 40 minutes, and then there'd be questions. Well, what we did was we all spread out. And after every speaker, one of these young guys would stand up in the back and say, I have a question. My name is Wilfred Lamastis. I'm from Panama, and I want to know blah, 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 blah made no difference the question or the subject. But by the end of this convention, they thought there'd been an invasion from Panama. I mean, with every session, there was some idiot in the back there from Panama. I want to know this, that, or the other. And it worked. Panama's coffee was beginning to attract some attention. And then it attracted a lot of attention. In the 1980s and 1990s, Kona, Hawaii, had begun to gain a reputation for exceptional coffee and its prices soared, even as commodity coffee prices were at historic lows. Kona coffee being sold for less than $8 a pound, and the coffee price was, back then was 60, 80 cents a pound. Kona is a pretty small place and could only produce so much coffee, not nearly enough to fill the rising demand. So an opportunistic coffee supplier decided to solve the problem all by himself. There was a guy in, in Hawaii and who had been buying coffee from Panama and he would bring it into the U.S. and one shift would dump the beans into, into a big bag with no name and then the next shift would put it into Kona bags. And they were selling it to the different roasters as Kona but it was Panamanian coffee. So it came out in the news. So it was in the coffee news all over. I, I, you know, at that moment, I, we, what we thought was, well, there must be something good with our coffee that the guy is doing this. I thought he was a visionary. You know, he knew us that we had great coffee. It was a fraud, and the guy went to jail and everything else. Everybody was saying, oh, Panamanian coffee is counterfeited for Kona coffee. So the, the things, two things he didn't know or he didn't anticipate was that the government in the U.S. wanted to catch up with him because he was uh, evading taxes, and that we would catch up with, that, with him because we would understand what we could, that we could do better with, with the coffee that we had. For us, it was very, very interesting because somebody told us right there without us knowing it, hey, your coffee is as good as gonna do something about it. In no time at all, Panama's coffee was on the global map. The scap growers knew they had quality coffee, but they also realized they couldn't prove it. So then we pushed more and more into specialty coffee. And at first we started out with a name, but we didn't have coffee that was special. We understood that we didn't understand coffee. Experts agree coffee quality is based on characteristics like aroma, flavor, acidity, body, balance, and sweetness. But how do you produce all of that? It begins with the planting of a seed and ends with the preparation of an aromatic infusion and incorporates an intricate chain in between that includes tending, harvesting, processing, milling, roasting, grinding, cupping or tasting, and brewing. All of these steps influence the quality of the final cup. Well, it turns out that there's a scoring system for coffee just like there is for wine. And it's based on 100 points. And you score so much for body, so much for aroma, so much for complexity, so much for this, so much for that. It's a very numerical 
objective scoring system. But to cup and score coffee, you first have to roast the raw beans. So they began figuring out how to get roasters. Nobody in Panama knew how to roast. We didn't even have a roaster. Either through the government or by making their own. Una de las máquinas más importantes que necesitábamos era una tostadora de muestra, o sea, es una máquina que en el mercado pues un poco alto su precio y que no estaba a nuestro alcance, así que tratamos de hacer una máquina que nos solucionara eso, ¿no? Eh, me tomó como dos años tratar de, 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 de formalizar la idea. Tiene un cilindro de acero inoxidable, o sea, para que sea resistente al, 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 al calor y que sea duradero. Parte de transmisión de algunos coches y la pieza principal, que es la tracción que le da rotación a la máquina, eh, es del timón de un coche que, que ya, no, ya no estábamos usando. ¿no? Eh, y ha funcionado, ya tiene como 10 años de estar funcionando y nos ha dado pues, el resultado que queríamos. We started burning so much coffee and making so much, you know, we were annoying, the smoke and everything else. We roasted up at least 50 or more batches until we discovered the proper point to roast coffee, the perfect curve. And then what was the next step? We need to learn how to cup. Cupping is a skill that's based on both science and experience. It quantifies and qualifies taste and demands considerable practice to master. The components for cupping scores revolve around multiple layers of plant-based flavor that make up the coffee taster's flavor wheel. First published in 1995, the flavor wheel has become one of the most iconic and frequently used resources in specialty coffee. Updated in 2016, through the Specialty Coffee Association and World Coffee Research, the Taster's Wheel provides an international industry standard and reference for coffee cupping everywhere. And the very first thing that you need to do is you need to learn how to cup. This is critical. It's very important. There's no way that you can understand the value of your product if you don't understand how a taste is related to a price. So we got together and we started cupping, just taking spoons and, and cupping coffee. We had no idea how to cup. We are just tasting coffee. The SCAP team realized they needed some training, so they went to the experts. During that time, I went to do a practical training and I was shown this training course in Probat in California was taking place. So there were training people on roasting and cupping. At that time, I started to learn uh, to cup with William, William Booth. The problem for Panama at that point in the late 90s was still that you would be at a cupping session and still, you know, one, two out of the coffees offered on the cupping table would be defective, would have processing issues, would have harvesting problems, specific issues that lead to taste defects that are not desirable. So we started bringing people down. Uh, George Howell was one of the first. And these were people who came down and really helped us better our coffee production. Not only telling us what was good and what was bad, but how to make it better. Uh, I was sent to Panama as a uh, trainer, as part of a group called the Coffee Corps, under the auspices of the Coffee Quality Institute. And uh, I'd gone to spend about 10 days training people how to cup coffee in Boquete. We started by learning how to, how to understand what the market was looking for. The scap growers began to understand exactly how and why their coffee was so good and what it was worth though they had always known Panama had what it takes to produce great coffee. We were lucky enough to have, to live in a place that had some very special uh, conditions for growing coffee. Panama is a special place for growing coffee due to its unique microclimates. Its geography is different compared to the rest of Central America because Panama runs east to west, not north to south. There are two big valleys in the region one in a place named Boquete, and the other in nearby Volcan. Because of the way the mountains are shaped, 
Some of the winds that bring moisture to the soil come from the Atlantic Ocean and some from the Pacific. Panama also has a continental divide that surrounds 7 million years old, containing a number of extinct volcanoes that have left a rich variety of minerals all over Panama's Pacific soil. This combination of different elevations, together with the crossing winds and moisture, creates ideal growing conditions for specialty coffee. So you may be in one uh, farm uh, where it rains seven months of the year and just across the valley, this is only 10 kilometers away, you can have another microclimate where it rains 11 months of the year. So there is a lot of different microclimates around the area. When you combine that with the different elevations and you have the winds that are going through there with different amounts of moisture, so you create different kinds of environment. And this is very interesting for the for the buyers because they can come to one event or to one farm and they can have an array of cups from the same type of variety of coffee that will taste very differently. And this is very unique to Panama. Panama also has a special history that contributes to highly disciplined farming and picking practices. Panama's indigenous Nobe Bugle workers really know the land and have worked in coffee for generations. Most critical to coffee flavor is how the cherries, the fruit around the bean or the seed, are harvested. Los Nobes, los Bugle, somos los grupos más disciplinados en las reglas de cómo cosechar el café. Y es ahí donde entonces tiene que ver con la producción de la calidad del producto. Porque hay reglas de cómo cosechar. Si es café maduro nada más, o café pintón, o café verde, hay procesos para eso. Por eso muchas veces se ve en las empresas de café que la mayoría de los empleados son nobles. Since not every cherry ripens at exactly the same time, cherries must be handpicked in batches by trained workers who know how to handle the fruit. This is very different from commodity coffee that is often picked by machine. Cada, cada micro lote no se cosecha igual, dependiendo el, 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 la calidad o la variedad que queramos recolectar. Se le explica el, el grado de madurez que necesitamos para, para cosecharlo. Se les dice por qué necesitamos que los cosechen así, que es muy importante que ellas, ellos sepan eso. ¿no? ¿Cuál es la ventaja de ellos? Que al ser especiales también tenemos que pagarles más. Some of the Nobe Bugle workers have gone beyond picking, learned the ropes, and risen through the ranks of coffee professionals. Yo vengo de la comarca. Me dispuse a recolectar café sin importarme los tiempos de lluvia que había, todo esto. Pero lo hacía con una satisfacción, con la esperanza de un día conocer más del café. Hace el cinco años eh, tuve la oportunidad de participar como prejuez nacional para evaluar las puntuaciones mías post-harvest handling of the cherries and beans is also critical to taste and quality. And Panama's growers have been at the forefront of coffee processing for many years. With the ability to produce great coffee and roast and cup it, scap growers could anticipate which beans were better than others and which were likely to get higher prices on the specialty market. In 1998, Panama launched its own Best of Panama competition with Specialty Coffee Association of America sponsorship and participating judges. It was a big success. The Best of Panama event got local coffee estates together to compete and compare. It attracted international experts and buyers, and it started an important tradition and means to raising the bar. The whole concept of judging coffees in a formal manner was very young, was very new. You know, there was a cup of excellence had started to do this in other countries um, a little bit later, actually, after Panama. And, but here in Panama, we always wanted to do this one level up from how the other countries were doing this, because we felt there was something special about this. In 2001, the Best of Panama team decided to launch an online auction. This helped them connect more directly with the worldwide specialty market and obtain even higher prices for their outstanding coffees. We knew that Brazil had just done an auction and we said, hey guys, why don't we do an auction? 
the guy who was running the auction, which was a staff uh, uh, for the SCAA, was Malcolm Stone. So we call Malcolm. Malcolm, we need to do an auction. We want to do an auction like Brazil did. Malcolm says, it. let's go. So we did the first Best of Panama online auction. The prize that we got for the top coffee, the winner, was six times higher than the C market price. It was a major breakthrough. And I will say to their great credit, the SCAP members and the, and the producers in Panama did the hard work of building on that and creating a, a marketplace and an image for their coffee that continues to persist and drives very, very high values. In the coffee industry that's small and where you're dealing directly with your roaster, you become family. You really do. I, I'd never appreciated this. When we sold to a broker, the coffee went out, disappeared, ended up God knows where. We never knew. But now you really follow the coffee through almost to the consumer. And it's a, it's a, great, it's a great feeling. SCAP professionalized the way Panamanian coffee growers did business, and it began to pay off. Meanwhile, the rest of the coffee world was not doing so well. While Panama was getting wiser and commanding higher prices through cupping, competing, and auctioning, commodity coffee was hitting an all-time low, worse even than the crisis a decade earlier that pushed Panama's growers into action. While many coffee farmers in Panama were getting five to 10 times market price, most coffee farmers in developing countries were not as fortunate. At the same time, the coffee industry continued to consolidate. Then, something happened that changed everything for specialty coffee around the world. In 1997, a farm on the other side of town came up for sale. This was about 6,000 feet elevation. We had added some experience with coffee, but nothing at that altitude. And it was an old farm that had lots of different kinds of coffee on it. And there was an upper part of the farm that was a valley that didn't get much sun, it got a lot of rain, and it was cold. We had a fellow helping us in those days, a, a, an advisor named Pachi Sedasin. And Pachi said, well, there's this old coffee that came to Panama many years ago, it's called geisha, but I think it's resistant to the cold, so why don't we try planting it up there? So in 1997, we planted it, walked away from it, didn't pay much attention. The following year, 1998, after really getting out one nice harvest from the farm, we get hit with a very bad weather, and we go went through a period of about three solid weeks of just overcast, drizzle, rain, and uh, after this, this, this front came through, it looked like somebody had taken buckets of hot water and thrown them on the trees, and only about three of these varieties really had leaves left on them, and geisha was one of them. This was, on this farm, was the first time I had come across that variety called geisha. I, I had never even heard of it before. So he went over and started harvesting coffee from different parts of the farm, brought it back here, processed it, and then he and his sister cupped it. And they cupped one, and they cupped the next one, and the next one, and nothing very exciting. And finally they came to one that tasted really different. You know, I, I tried it, and it's just really, really different. It's just very fruity. This is. There's something wrong. This is the, the first thing that came to mind. I, we did something really wrong and so different. And we didn't know if this coffee was really good or bad. We knew it was different, but different good or different bad. We were really fortunate in having some buyers from the United States come through shortly after that. And we tried this coffee on them, not knowing what they were gonna say. And they went crazy.
As I was going through them, I thought, wait a minute, somebody's moved copies or switched them. These aren't Panamanian copies. This is this coffee's clearly Ethiopia. And then Daniel said, no, he said, that's, uh, that's our coffee. And the coffees were fantastically good. And I said, why are you going, how do you know this is better coffee? How, how do you know this is great coffee? And they said, when we do it, by when we count this up and this up and this up and this up, we come to 95. We've never cupped a coffee that came to 95 before. So we know it's different and it's really good. The Petersons decided to compete with the Geisha variety, and it took everyone by surprise and broke every existing cupping score record to date. Well, there was definitely a sense of joy. You could see happiness on the judges' faces as they were trying these. Uh, we had a a judge gave a, a perfect 100 to the geisha one time. We had, I remember another judge just sitting at the end. He'd already done his scoring, turned in his sheet, and he's just sitting at the cupping table and taking the cup that has the grinds on the bottom and it's still working, and just picking up and drinking until the, you know, the very last drop is gone. Shortly thereafter, at the auction following the Best of Panama, there was even more excitement. So we're, we're sitting um, in the office watching the auction. I had been talking to my dad and he was really hoping to get a price of $6 per pound. Previous auctions, a base price was $1 and then the, the bids were $1, a dollar one, a dollar two, dollar three, dollar four, until we reached 480 or 237 or whatever in a period of six hours. When we had the Geisha in 2004, a minute after the auction was open, it shut down. We said, what? What happened to the auction? So call Malcolm. Hey, Malcolm, what happened to the auction? It froze. He said, yes, there is a hacker. Wilford, there is a hacker. So I shut it down on purpose. Okay. Oh, there is a hacker, guys. He shut it down. So let's see what he does. Then he calls us back. What happened, Malcolm? He says, there is no hacker. They bid $10, not one cent, $10 a pound right there as soon as it opened. So guys, good luck. So we were super excited. We watched it go all the way up to $21 a pound and, and then it closed out. $21, that was like 25 times above CMART. It was the moment where that glass ceiling that was the price of coffee or a specialty coffee at that moment was broken. That changed everything. All eyes in specialty coffee were now in Geisha. Everyone wanted to know where it had come from and how it had gotten to Panama. Like all coffee varieties, Geisha originated in Ethiopia and made its way out of Africa only somewhat recently. In the 1930s, a daring British soldier stationed in Africa named Captain Richard Wally was searching for disease-resistant coffee varieties in Ethiopia. So, he led an expedition into the mountains of warring tribal groups and managed to get some geisha seeds out of the country and into Kenya. From there, the seeds made their way to Tanzania and then eventually to Costa Rica's Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Center, CATIE, for its acronym in Spanish. A Panamanian agricultural engineer named Don Pachi Serracin eventually brought the geisha seeds from Costa Rica to Panama in 1963. Mi papá fue un técnico en agronomía, se especializó en café y en una oportunidad estando en el Catie se encuentra con este varietal geisha y Técnicos del Cati le dicen, hombre, Pachi, tú estás loco, pero ¿para qué te estás llevando esto? Si es una planta que es muy alta, muy poco productora, y encima de todo, no, no sabe a café. Entonces, ¿tú qué vas a hacer con un árbol que ni siquiera sabe a café? O sea, déjate de esas locuras. Pues dijo, no, yo me la llevo y, 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 y la voy a sembrar en mi finca. After its 2004 Panama debut, Geisha became the bell of the ball. It was planted throughout Panama and Latin America and rose to the top of specialty coffee charts everywhere. We routinely see geisha spelled both with and without the letter I. 
because of different translations from the Ethiopian word for the variety's place of origin. Specialty coffee experts continue to debate over the proper spelling, but the majority of the world appears to lean toward the spelling that includes the I, which is the same as the word for the Japanese entertainers. This may have something to do with how much the growing Asian market loves geisha. Probably 80% of all the Bocchetti specialty coffee now goes to Asia. And Japan was really the leader in that, in that movement. There's this gentleman in Japan who, uh, well, he's quite a character. And he has started setting world records, fortunately, with coffees from Panama. In recent decades, Asia has been steadily increasing its coffee drinking and is now the fastest growing region in the world for specialty coffee. Uh, basically, all over Asia, uh, we drink a lot of tea and uh, I feel like the, the geisha variety and the flavors are very similar of what uh, our customers are looking for. As Asian experts and enthusiasts make up more and more of the specialty coffee judges, baristas, and buyers around the world, their influence over tastes and quality standards is only likely to grow. I love coffee. I, I, I make coffee because I love to drink coffee. The coffee from Panama it tastes totally different. I try many geysas around the world. I don't know. You have some God gift. The variety here is tastes so different. It's one category. It's the Panama geysa and another. Panama coffee to me, it's, it's something special. We've been coming since 2005 and, and, and buying. And as long as we've been coming, the first time we we broke $100 a pound for coffee. We had it delivered in an armored truck so that people could see there was something different, something special. And what's so unique about Geisha is people can taste the difference. Geisha coffee has stimulated a whole new interest in coffee, which wasn't there before. There's this famous quote from a fellow named Don Holly, who was cupping in a, in a competition, and he cupped the Geisha coffee, put his cup down, and he said, I have now seen God in a cup. Great phrase. Panama's good fortune in discovering and revealing the deliciously beautiful geisha to the world didn't end there, however. By tracing its roots back to Ethiopia, Panama's coffee growers once again revolutionized specialty coffee through their adventurous and innovative spirit, together with stubborn perseverance. After I tasted um, for the first time the geisha in 2004, you know, I couldn't get the idea out of my mind Having been also in Ethiopia that same year, I couldn't just stop the thought that this coffee might still be around somewhere. I remember that William came to a jazz festival and he was with this guy who was a tostador of new coffee, Joseph Broski. And we went to that night and said, OK, you want to go to Panama? Let's go to a jazz festival for the Casco Viejo. Y los tipos empiezan a hablar de Etiopía. Y le digo, ¿y ustedes qué hacen en Etiopía? ¿Ah? ¿Qué hacen metidos allá? Y esa vaina es un desierto, se está muriendo la gente de hambre. Y William me volteó a ver y me dice, Naciano, no seas tan ignorante. Etiopía tiene más bosques que Panamá. Me dice, ¿tú quieres ir a Etiopía? Yo te invito. Nosotros tenemos una catación y te, puedo, te vamos a invitar de juez a esa catación. Hace dos semanas me trepé un avión y me fui para Etiopía. It was on this trip that Panama's Graciano Cruz and U.S. coffee expert Joseph Brodsky started brainstorming about natural processing and how to bring it to Panama. I was following the tastes 
And when I tasted the geisha coffee here in Panama, it was the first time outside of Ethiopia that I tasted uh, something that was very ex exotic and beautiful, uh, like Ethiopian coffee. And at first I was working with other producers to try to maximize this geisha variety through processing that I was bringing from Ethiopia. No, cuando, cuando llego a Panamá y empiezo a hacer esto y decido procesar mi propio café sin agua, cosechándolo muy maduro, con sabores a frutas muy fuertes. Ese tipo de proceso era lo que más hacía en Etiopía. ¿Por qué? Porque no tenían beneficio húmedo. Except Brazil, nobody in America did naturals on purpose. Most of America gets a lot of rain during the harvest season, so doing a wash coffee is much more uh, faster, energy efficient in a way. Pero por qué tener un solo proceso? Era mi pregunta. Washed processing uses water to strip the fruit from the seed before drying the bean. Natural processing is a method for removing the seed from the coffee cherry that basically dries the fruit off the bean in the open air without using water. Yo dije, bueno, esta es la única manera que yo puedo procesar mi café sin usar agua. But change from old habits is difficult. In spite of the fact that natural processing historically precedes washed processing, people in the United States and Latin America were not used to natural processing, and not many were willing to experiment with the precious geisha. I think initially the processing that ideas that we brought from Ethiopia were a bit controversial. Uh, we do a lot of fermentation of coffee, um, where uh, fermented taste, and that's considered a defect. And the buyers who were coming here were saying, guys, you're gonna ruin the cup profile of your wash coffee. You're gonna destroy the industry. Don't produce natural coffee. In the coffee, if you allow the, the pulp to stay in the bean, then you're gonna have a lot of this flavor. So we were making an, an, an analogy with wine. So the wash coffee was like the white wine. The natural coffee was like the red wine. And the honey coffee would be like a rosé. So we say, well, if this happens in, in wine, maybe we can make it happen in coffee. After the initial failures and the resistance from international judges and buyers, Natural processed coffee caught on. And in 2011, the natural processed category was officially added to the Best of Panama competition. Since then, nearly every year, natural processed coffees from Panama have commanded the highest prices in the world. The natural coffees uh, for me this year was also exceptional. I, I feel that uh, people are, are, are looking for this kind of coffees more and more. Then,在标，所以我们就一直想要标下这一只咖啡。那标下这一只咖啡的时候，就是在全世界的呃曝光上对我们有非常大的帮助，所以我们觉得买的非常值得。The 2019 Best of Panama auction closed with Geisha, breaking yet another record. The Lamastis Estates Alita Green Tip Natural Geisha sold for $1,029 a pound, making it the most expensive coffee in the world ever sold to public auction. Again, the innovators went against the establishment, and they won. I see, first of all, a whole movement of different processes coming along, playing with processing, playing with uh, different forms of ferment, playing with things like uh, yeast inoculation or harvesting, to me, the biggest impact Panama has had on coffee is two. So that emphasis on variety. So now there are many varieties that taste different and are unique and made people realize 
Uh, that variety is one of the key components of flavor creation. So people around the world are looking to Panama not only for variety, but also for processing. And it's amazing to see the risks that they're willing to take to make a delicious cup of coffee for us. Somehow, the Panamanian growers' embrace of natural processing from geisha's origins ended up paying tribute to Ethiopia and creating the most sought after bean in the world. One of the things that excite me about Panama, while they introduce geisha to the world, a different variety, they've got the toir, they've got everything here, is they don't stand on their laurels. They're pushing themselves to really promote the, the naturals, to promote experimentation, to see what they can do next. And in the most recent years, it's, it's those naturals and that geisha that have really brought prominence to Panama and allowed us to introduce them again to the, our customers and really the world now. In the space of just three decades, our Panamanian growers have moved from the back of the class to the front of the class on the world stage of specialty coffee. They speak to producers and consumers all around the globe, hoping others can benefit from the Panama story as the sector grapples with economic and environmental sustainability. They had something beautiful, and rather than keep it, they shared it with producers around the world, and I think it, it's changing not only the flavor of coffee, but it's changing the earning potential of coffee. And in times when it is so hard to be a producer and to make money at it, the fact that Panama is willing to share like this precious thing, I think is just incredible. So Panama's coffee has made it, coming a long way from where it was in 1989 when our story started. Specialty coffee everywhere has also come a long way. We're in an extraordinary moment here in time where specialty coffee has, uh, has grown tremendously over the last two decades uh, and we're delivering fantastic coffee into consumers' hands and consumers are, are loving it. At the same time, we've watched coffee prices for, uh, for commercial green coffee slip to uh, historical lows. Prices are below the cost of production for most of the coffee producing world, and especially in, uh, in Mesoamerica and Central America. So it's, uh, it's really at crisis levels for many coffee farmers. The way the sea market is sold, the way the speculations control the coffee prices, that's the biggest enemy. And the industry continues to consolidate. A few huge multinational corporations now own the majority of roasters and retailers for both commodity and specialty coffee. So a widespread solution will have to involve these same companies working together with the coffee associations and the national growers. Uh, we've got to find a way to make that uh, that value chain work and function uh, seamlessly so that we get both great coffee and great value to farm. And I think together we can, you know, as a, as a growing region, we can set an example for other coffee producing regions in the world for uh, how we can change the coffee economy and transform the coffee production model. Environmental sustainability is also an issue. We have to go back to our farms. We have to look at you know, the basic fundamental question about how do we grow these coffees? Should we maybe use more natural resources? There's massive potential to have impact. You know, the coffee industry really can actually have a material uh, difference in the climate change on the planet. Not everywhere will have Panama's privileged growing conditions, but many can apply much of the rest that has made Panamanian coffee so successful. And I think that one of the things that Panama is doing is showing that there is a, a way to change the model. And this can help the whole world. And I must tell one very personal story. We decided in the 90s that we would build a processing operation, and then we would be able to sell our own coffee. I didn't know a damn thing about how to build a Beneficio or anything else. And another man, Mr. Thatcher Lamastus, was a neighbor. And nothing would do but that he would drop in here every day when we were building and say, no, I don't think you should do it that way, you ought to do it this way. He came over here 
literally I remember every day at some points, to make sure we did things right and we didn't foul it up from the beginning. That is the whole way we've developed coffee all over Panama. Through the Specialty Coffee Association of Panama has been absolute. Everybody helps everybody. Todo ese grupo de energía positiva que tienen los panameños y que le metemos a nuestro café es muy difícil de igualar. Probably one word that would unite us all was the word passion. We were all passionate about what we were doing. My purpose at the end is continue doing what I like the best, what I love, what I enjoy. Every single moment of my life is coffee. This, this would be our legacy to, to the future generations of, of coffee. Continuous learning, collaborative competition and innovation, together with purpose, passion, and perseverance. We're competitors, but we're collaborators. How the community collaborates in order to survive. We're all in the same boat. We're going to sink or we're going to swim together. Even after the competition, whoever wins the competition, or after a, a big argument about how and what should we do, we can always sit down and have a beer. That is a mixture that is hard to get at. And it took us time to understand that. But when we understood that, then we understood the power that that has. We've kind of become an institution, which was never our intent. It's not a bad thing to be. It's kind of nice, actually. Sometimes we lose in competitions to other people. Sometimes we win. It's been a, it's been a good ride. So what really goes into your daily cup of coffee? And what is that worth? And who decides that? A lot goes into your daily cup of coffee. It's worth what someone's willing to pay. And we all decide that. <laughs>